How's everybody doing? Feel free to get up and stretch if you need to stand up in your spot. Walk around a little bit, get your blood flowing. Um, Deborah Dean Whitaker and I are going to split this section. These are frequently asked questions, and um, for the most part, they're divided between the HIS uh, questions presentation that I did this morning and then the CAPS. So I'll do my part and then we'll have her come up. Let's see. So our goal for this section, based on the questions that come up frequently, are to describe the hospice item set, what's required, um, discuss the recommended timing for completion and submission of the HIS, talk about how to address updated payer information on the HIS, explain how hospice can discuss the consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems, the CAPS, hospice survey with decedents and caregivers, and the define and define a no publicity decedent type of caregiver. Okay, so we'll start with the HIS and hospice HQRP program. So when is an HIS record required? Basically, this is determined based on whether the patient was admitted to the hospice or not. So for completing this HIS, the patient is considered admitted to a hospice if they follow the following conditions. One, the patient has signed an election form. Whether it be a Medicare patient or a non-Medicare patient, you, they might have some kind of other agreement that you have them sign. The patient did not expire before the effective date of the election or the agreement for care. And the hospice made a visit in the setting where hospice services are to be initiated. So if all three of those conditions are met, then you would submit an HIS record for admission and discharge. So I was thinking about an example of this, and I could see uh, making a home visit with a consult, the family and the patient signing on and saying, you know, we really don't want the services to start till tomorrow because the visiting nurse is coming or I have a physical therapist, I want to wrap that up before I actually start hospice. So say you plan to go the next day, the patient's still alive, but then you get a call, the patient died, the VNA went out and did the pronouncement, you wouldn't submit an HIS in that instance. Does that make sense? So here's just a little um, algorithm to show that. So there has to be a signed election form. If there isn't, not required to put in HIS. If there is, you answer yes. Did the patient expire prior to the effective date? If they did not, did you actually make a visit in the, in the, in the home or to the place where the patient was going to receive services? And if all three of those, then you would submit an HIS. I see a hand up back there. Technically, I, I mean, someone else can jump up and answer if they like, but I, I would think that it would have to be the admission, that you'd have to have officially admitted that patient. Now, your RN has two days to finish doing that initial RN assessment, but as long as the patient was officially admitted and a visit was made in that setting, I would think that that would suffice. Anybody back there would have a different answer? You want them to go to the microphone? Yeah. Nobody can hear you if you're, um, you want to get up to the microphone? Yeah. 
I was answering a question. The question was if the social worker admitted with a notice of election, but the, the RN did not complete the assessment or did not do the assessment, you do not do a HIS. Both things are required to be considered admitted into hospice. Two things. Actually, it's three. The nurse has to say the patient is eligible. She does the assessment. The social worker does the NOE. And when I say the nurse has to say it's appropriate, if she says this patient isn't appropriate for hospice, doesn't qualify, it stops until we go back and get more information. Yeah, I think, um, I think we'll have to answer that later to make sure we get it official and correct. Yeah. But, but if I don't have it right, let me know. I think one of the things I'm going to move wanna, on. Yeah, I'm going to move on. Okay, I was just going to say, just to clarify, I think that the nurse should be speaking with the physician to declare whether or not the patient is right. hospice eligible. And once that piece happens, then we can go ahead. If the doctor yeah. says no, then no. Yeah, we'll, we'll address that officially because I think that um, there's a little lack of clarity here. So basically, and I'm going to go to the next slide. So is an HIS required for all hospice patients or only for those whose care is covered by Medicare? HIS admission and discharge records are required for all patients admitted to a Medicare certified hospice regardless of their length of stay, the payer source, their age, where the hospice care is delivered, or the size of the hospice. So what happened to the requirements for completion deadlines for the HIS? In the fiscal year 2016 rule, CMS clarified that the completion deadlines continue to reflect CMS's guidance only. These guidelines are not statutorily specified and are not designated through regulation. The guidelines are intended to offer clear direction to hospices with regard to timely submission of the HIS admission and HIS discharge records. So the recommended completion deadline for the HIS admission is defined as the admission date plus 14 calendar days. The recommendation for the discharge record is defined as the discharge date plus seven days. So although it's at the discretion of the hospice to develop internal policies for completing the HIS records, CMS recommends that hospices work on completing these early prior to the 30-day submission deadline. Completing and attempting to submit records early allows hospices to address any technical issues and allow you to make sure that you're really meeting that 30-day submission deadline. So the 14-day and the 7-day is a recommendation to get them done early, but the actual deadline is 30 days after the admission date or at 30 days after the discharge date. So the next question. If a patient receives a Medicare or Medicaid number after the HIS admission record has been submitted, should we complete a modification? And the answer is, it's not necessary. If a patient receives a Medicare or Medicaid number after HIS admission records have been submitted, Rather, if the hospice is notified after it's been submitted that the patient does actually have a Medicaid or Medicare number, the number will be included on the next submission or the next record, what, probably your discharge. Um, this is also true for a newly identified Social Security number. So here's a question about the patient's payer source. Should the hospice complete an HIS discharge record and a new HIS admission record? Here we go. 
So provided there's no interruption in the care, when the patient's payer source changes from a private payer to Medicare, the hospice does not need to complete an HIS discharge record and then readmit them. Um, basically, as long as everything has stayed the same in terms of the patient, even if the payer source changes, your admission HIS has already been completed and you would just wait till discharge to submit the next one. Um, so hospice will submit an HIS discharge record once the patient is no longer receiving services from the hospice or in the event of some type of interruption in the care. Um, the HIS is specifically related to the collection of quality data. If the patient had only a payer change, there is no need to submit a new HIS. So here's a little polling scenario for you. Um, Mr. Jameson, Mrs. Jameson, wants to pursue aggressive therapy outside the hospice plan of care. Her prognosis has not changed. She will be discharged from hospice. What reason for discharge should be coded in item A2115, the reason for discharge for Mrs. Jameson? A, revoked. B, 03, no longer terminally ill. Or C, 06, discharged for cause. You get your polling things there? OK. So take a minute and answer that question. Okay, 85% of you said A, revoked. And that is the correct answer. So she's decided to pursue aggressive treatment. That was her choice she's certainly able to revoke. Because patients revoke, hospices can discharge, but patients have to revoke themselves. Okay, so if a hospice has fewer than 50 admissions per year, is there an exemption for submission of data? We talked about that a little bit this morning. There is no exemption from HIS reporting due to size. All Medicare certified hospice agencies must collect and submit data on all hospice admissions starting in uh, July of 2014 onward. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Deborah Dean Whitaker, who's going to talk more about the frequently asked questions and the CAPS survey. Okay. Is this better now? Okay. It's, okay. This, I can tell it's louder. Okay. If you are a Medicare certified hospice and you are not otherwise exempt by either size or newness, in order to receive your full APU, you need to be participating in the CAPS hospice survey. Notice, however, that the patients eligible to receive the survey are not limited to Medicare patients. Any payer source for the patient can be included. So the short answer to who must participate is, if you're a Medicare certified hospice and you're not exempt, you're in. Okay, next question. This is an interesting question. How does a hospice confirm that its, CASP, its CAPS hospice survey data has been submitted to CMS? Now, we have a number of detailed slides here, and I urge you afterwards to kind of go through these carefully and think about them. Let me make a few general comments to start. The first thing is this. You are responsible for making sure that your vendor submits data on time. In general, if vendors fail to do that, 
and you are then declared non-compliant, in general, CMS does not recognize that as grounds for non-compliance. It is also the case that we do not accept late submissions. The next data submission deadline for hospice caps is February 8th. Oh, something really terrible happens and your vendor drops the ball, they can submit it on the 9th. We won't take it. We have a hard and fast rule. We operate like the evening news. You never hear the evening news say, oh, we're not ready, come back in five minutes. It's, this is the deadline. Now, what does that mean to you? What that means to you is you want to get a jump on things. We recommend that you get to know your vendor's project director for your uh, survey project and talk to them. Call them up. How are we doing? I noticed that we're going to have a survey deadline, a data submission deadline in about two weeks, 10 days, whatever. Are you going to be ready? When are you going to submit my data? Get to know them. Make sure they know you're watching. And find out what they say. We're going to submit this on the Wednesday before. Well, find out. The next thing you want to do is you want to consider getting access to the Hospice Caps Data Warehouse. The vendors communicate with the data warehouse when they're submitting data. And some of these vendors are submitting for a thousand hospices at a time. So there's masses of data coming in and reports going back and forth between the vendors and the, wa the warehouse. But the warehouse also has reports for you. And this is a way for you to find out what's going on without having to rely totally on what your vendor has to say. So it is a good idea to get access to the reports on the data warehouse. And you can see here on the uh, second bullet here um, that you need to log in. Why? We want to keep this information private to you. This is not public information. Another hospice cannot log into your information here. You have to have your own login. Now, right after uh, these slides were finalized, uh, it turned out RAND upgraded their system. So the URL listed there is not correct for getting to the login. I will read you the difference, and if we update these slides at all, I'm going to see if we can get an update ready for you. But here is the new URL. It is the same in part. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash K I T E W O R K S dot rand dot org. So the new part here is the word kite works. Now, you need to submit a form to get access to the data warehouse. And that form can be found on the survey website, uh, which is listed here. This is correct. And each hospice will have its own folder in, the, in this data warehouse. So you will be getting your reports and nobody else's. The vendors, by contrast, get reports for all of their hospices. So they may be getting yours and others, but it's others that they serve. You, however, will only get yours and other hospices will only get theirs. Didn't move. Let's see here, try again. Okay. Now, the next couple of slides talk about the kind of things that happen back and forth between uh, the data warehouse and the reports that are provided to you. This is why I say you might want to look over this in detail later. Um, some of this information is also available in the Quality Assurance Guidelines Manual, also on the survey website. After a file has been submitted by the vendor, to the data warehouse, the vendor and the hospice will get an automatic email saying data's been submitted. Um, and then, if successfully submitted, the data will be put through a series of checks. And you will get a second email indicating that reports are available for viewing on the data warehouse. These reports will be posted by 5 p.m. on the day after the data, the next business day, after the data upload. So if the data is uploaded on Monday, you're going to get reports by 5 p.m. on Tuesday. And it's very important to take a look at these. And 
You may find them hard to read at first because you don't, you're not survey vendor people. But take a look at it. If you have questions, call our or email our technical assistance people. They will help you read these things. Okay? And so you can, you can review them and you should review them. Okay, that's not it. Oh, wait a minute. Oh dear, this is like going out here. Okay, so you will need to review your reports. Vendors also need to review their reports, but you should be reviewing them too and make sure you know what's going on. And don't hesitate to call the vendor and say, well, I looked at the report last night. It looked like the file failed. Is that correct? They know you're watching. Uh, survey vendors are required to continue to resubmit corrected data files. And uh, each time this happens, you'll get updated reports. So you can kind of follow what's going on. Okay? But do try to take a proactive stance. Because the problem is that once it passes the deadline, it's too late. So try to get things in before and try to watch. Okay, next question. Get this? Okay. Can a hospice discuss the hospice surveys with decedents, well, not when they're decedents, but when they're patients and caregivers? The short answer is yes, but there are some conditions. I'm going back here. If you would like to let caregivers or patients know that the caregivers may get a survey, you can encourage them to complete it. But if you tell one, you tell them all. So you could put it in your introductory packet, for example, make sure everybody knows that this is possible. What you can't do is try to influence the responses to the survey. So in other words, if any of you have been at a car dealer and the guy says to you, give me a 10 or I'm going to get fired, don't do that. Uh, don't do it. It ruins the survey. You're not allowed to do that. Don't do anything to influence uh, the responses. Now, some of you have heard of the no publicity patient. Uh, so let's talk about what that means. The no publicity patient caregiver pairs are those who initiate or voluntarily request that the hospice not reveal the patient's identity or maybe not do a survey. Notice that the initiation of this request must come from the patient or caregiver. It can't come from the hospice. Uh, we had in a completely different program a situation where a provider was asking when people came into the service, would you like to answer a survey? They would check no, and then the, they sent in, well, we don't have anybody who is eligible, so we're free, we don't have to do the survey. <coughs> we found out about this and said, look, you can't do that. You can't approach them and ask. They have to tell you. This is uh, for a situation where you have maybe a locally well-known person doesn't want this information revealed. They ask that the information not be made public. Um, you must retain documentation of the no publicity request for a minimum of three years. Okay, how do you change survey vendors? In other CAPS um, projects, this has been the danger zone. And I would suggest to you that one of the first things you want to do when you're really thinking about changing the vendors is call or email our technical assistance team. They can lead you through it. And it's very important to do that because you have to have data for all 12 months to be in full compliance. So you don't want the thing to drop and now you've got two months of no data and the thing isn't working and now you're two months out of compliance. Email, call the technical assistance team. They are very nice about helping you formulate a timeline and figure out what you're gonna do and when you're gonna do it so you have the seamless changeover from the old one to the new one. Okay. Um, and also kind of read some of these details. Uh, take a look at some of this. Um, come on now. All right. Um, 
some of this is very, again, very detailed. I don't know that it's to our advantage to try to do this verbally, but I would suggest rereading this a little bit. You should only change vendors at the beginning of a quarter. Uh, don't try to do it in the middle of a quarter, because then you end up in a situation which we've had sometimes where you've got two different vendors charging you and two different vendors trying to submit data for the data warehouse, and this turns into a mess. So you can change vendors at the beginning of a quarter, okay? And a quarter is um, based on the calendar year. It would be January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. So those first ones that I emphasized is the beginning of the quarter. Um, for example, uh, we say here that uh, quarter one in 2017 starts with January of 2017. And that is referencing the patient deaths, not when the survey is distributed, which is in April, but the patient deaths in January. Now, of course, there's a form. Um, your survey administrator must complete an authorization form for changing vendors, and this can be found on the survey website. We want to make sure that nobody is changing vendors for you or nothing strange is happening, so you need to get the form in and follow it carefully. And you can see here you have to submit the form at least one quarter, prior, one quarter, 90 days, before the time the data is submitted, blah, 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 blah. Read this carefully. But this is why you really do want to talk to the, the technical assistance team so you can lay it out. Okay, I'm going to submit my form here. And I'm going to start with a new guy here. And you see, notice this form has to be uh, notarized. So you're going to be sending it in. And here again, they're talking about um, the forms. If you are changing vendors for more than one uh, CCN at a time, you can attach the list, but you may need to make a checkbox or something like that. You don't have to submit a separate form, but make sure you've carefully followed the instructions. Oops. Hmm. Well, I guess we go to a question, OK? Um, and this question is something we've talked about a couple of times. Uh, the initial contact, um, when will the initial contact aimed at administering the CAP survey be made with a caregiver if the patient dies in December of 2016? Would the initial contact come in January of 2017, February of 2017? March of 2017 or April of 2017. Everybody ready, pretty much? Let's see if they can give us a count. Yeah, there's a countdown clock, so maybe it'll wait a minute and give us something. the button again? Yes, the correct answer is March. If it happens in December, the lag is January, February, and the first contact will be in March. Okay, now, how does a hospice confirm if its exemption for size form has been approved? Another interesting question. Okay. We will confirm the receipt of your exemption for size form. You send it in, we'll send you back a receipt that says you submitted it. Keep your receipt. This is proof you submitted the form. And there are instances where you may need to prove that. You may need to be able to come back to us and say, I did submit the form and here's proof. Um, confirmation of the receipt of the form does not mean it's approved or denied. CMS will determine your eligibility um, based on um, 
we, what we have to do is we have to wait because we will run this right before we do the APU determination. And we give the opportunity for any lag time so you can have patients coming in and there's a lag, so we run it once at that time. And if your hospice qualifies, you'll get it. If it doesn't, you won't. Now, um, that kind of leaves you in the lurch because we don't, are not really telling you if you're gonna get it. But if you go through the form on the website very carefully and fill it out very carefully, you should be assured that you'll be okay because remember, the reference year is the year before. So you should be able to give an accurate count. And if you can get us an accurate count, the probability of your being accepted is much, much higher. We do check though, and the reason we do is not to be sneaky and get you if you're one over. But we have in other projects found some providers are saying, well, I have fewer than 60 patients. And then we look at our data and it shows they have 200. Well, we don't give them the exemption for size because they are much too far off. So um, what you need to do is make sure that you, keep, that you keep your receipt so that you can demonstrate that you did indeed submit it. We, we don't usually have a problem like this, but it's just insurance for you. Be as careful as you can filling out the form. Again, if you have any problems, uh, let us know. It's an interesting fact that because we are basically an insurance company, we're dealing with claims. We're dealing with transactions. We're not dealing with people. We're dealing with claims. And so what happens is sometimes a new person can come in and there's a lag in getting their claims submitted. So at any one time, CMS could do a run, but maybe new people would be coming in and they wouldn't be counted yet. That's why we wait till right before we do the APU determination and we do one big run that shows us the size and counts not on the basis of claims, but on the basis of people. And that's all I have, so thank you very much. Yes, yes. Clarify uh, no publicity. And how does that correlate with a family that declines to be followed by bereavement? Uh, I don't think there's any correlation with family declining to be followed by bereavement. They can do that independent. The, the way we think of no publicity is if the mayor of the city were entered into hospice and didn't want it known, and they asked, to, did it not happen? It's really basically a celebrity exception for, for people who don't want their names involved. It's the George, George Clooney exception, you know? That's what we mean by that. So can you give me a scenario where, it, if, so hospice A, are they telling all of their patients that they will be getting a survey and somewhere from day of admission to day of death, they say, I don't want to be in the survey, that's easy. What's another scenario where it would be crystal clear where no publicity is? In, uh... Well, it would, be, it would be crystal clear if the patient and their caregiver were to be entered into hospice and they say, we don't want this fact that, that this person is receiving hospice care. We don't want you to release this information. Okay. And in All fact, right. that's really the primary thing that we're concer concerned about is that there may be people who do not want their names released. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. But please do not ask them if they want to answer a survey. We will find out, and it's going to be trouble, so don't do it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>